and welcome uh, to yet another taste talk. We have Lydia Burns, our favorite cheesemonger here with us today. And how appropriate on this ridiculously hot day, we are going to be talking about fresh summer cheeses. So more of those lighter cheeses. You know, you don't want to say I don't want any cheese, even when it's hot out. There's definitely ones that fit the hot weather. So Lydia, we are very excited to hear about this. The summer is definitely not over at all no. any, in any amount. So please go ahead and take it away. Yeah, I mean, if you guys uh, are anything like me today, you're kind of sweating it out. Yeah, cheese is not usually your go-to top of mind food for a day like today. Usually I think of uh, I want to eat fruit. I want to eat tomatoes. I want to eat what's in season and what is refreshing. And uh, it turns out there's a way to still integrate cheese uh, into all those beautiful summer produce that we have. And I think the best accompaniment for both the weather and those sorts of uh, produce is to go with a fresh cheese. So fresh cheese is a category I think everyone is familiar with. Everyone sort of knows um, general styles within this, whether they realize how many different uh, iterations of that there are. You know, we have our um, baseline fresh cheeses, which are really, really simple. It's uh, essentially one step removed from the milk that originates it. And these are gonna be things like ricotta or cottage cheese. Uh, I actually, I'm a very passionate cottage cheese lover. And a lot of my friends find this very surprising because they think of cottage cheese as kind of boring and mild. And I will say that a lot of cottage cheese that's out there on the market is all of those things. <laughs> um, but if you can find a producer that makes traditional old style cottage cheese, this is my favorite brand and you can get this at Whole Foods. It's Kelowna Supernatural. And make sure you get the whole milk one. They have, I mean, if you prefer skim or 2%, they have that. But this is really like one of my go-to summer cheeses because it's so fresh. And this one has, uh, it's what they call old-fashioned cottage cheese, which means it has a larger, squeakier curd. Sometimes uh, cottage cheese can just be sort of semi-solid, semi-liquid, but there's not a lot of texture to it. This is more traditional, what we would call curds and whey, which is what cottage cheese is and what is the building blocks of all cheeses. Um, and essentially how this is made is that um, the, the milk is acidified, uh, usually using uh, lemon juice or uh, sometimes they use rennet as well, which is an enzyme that's used to make cheese as a coagulant. It's actually derived from the stomach of a, uh, an animal, usually a calf, uh, lamb, or kid that has only wheat on milk, uh, which makes sense because that enzyme is built for them to digest milk. And so if we extract that enzyme, we can use it to jumpstart the cheese making process. In a lot of fresh cheeses, they don't need rennet because rennet is just more solid than using an acid such as yogurt, vinegar, wine, or like a citrus. But um, when you make a harder cheese, usually rennet is necessary because you need that more binding power. But when you start with these cheeses, it's really just the fundamental baseline, a little bit of acidification. And then sometimes additionally, like milk or cream is added after the fact. Ricotta is a little different. I'll go over that in a sec. But what I really like about these cheeses is they just are milky and mild. It's really about the texture. And in the case of the ricotta cheese, one of my favorite, my favorite preparations is really only good about this time of year or upcoming August, I think through September is tomato season. But I love to get heirloom tomatoes, cherry tomatoes or larger ones. It doesn't really matter, whatever you prefer. And um, I love to put them on top of the, the cottage cheese and get a really nice olive oil, drizzle that on it. Actually not drizzle, I usually drench, but it depends on what you prefer. And then just some fresh herbs and it's incredibly filling 
but it's not super heavy again because you can eat this cold um you know it's just something refreshing and light and really uh the creaminess and that fun texture from this old style cottage cheese just goes really great with the pop of texture from the tomato and the pop of acidity that you get from the tomatoes as well. So that's just like one of my all time favorite go to preparations. Uh, and I like to take advantage of it in the summer because the tomatoes are better. So this is really a, a great time to use a, a really delicate fresh cheese to just amplify the experience of all these delicious summer bounty that we have. And uh, ricotta similarly, the main difference with ricotta is it's actually made from whey. Uh, so the remainder of uh, a cheese making process. So to, traditionally ricotta was made from the leftover whey from Parmigiano Reggiano in Emilia Romagna in Italy. Um, but now uh, it's a recipe that's been adopted all over the world. And uh, essentially you take that whey, the leftover whey, and then uh, it, gets recooked, which is what the ricotta means. It means recooked, literally. And uh, so then you usually add additional milk just to add body and make the mouth feel better. And then it's, and then it's acidified and then it's heated to a really high temperature. And then that's how you get ricotta. So ricotta is gonna have a slightly different texture than the cottage cheese because of this uh, method. It's a little more, um, a little more solid and uh, a little bit smaller sort of grainy like particles rather than the, the larger curd of the traditional cottage cheese. But this is another cheese that's really just about sort of the expression of the lactic notes of the raw material. And so it goes really great. I like ricotta with fruit a lot. Um, so of course, tomatoes you could do, but um, some of the stone fruit we talked about before, I think peaches are really great with ricotta, especially if you're gonna grill peaches or grilled some kind of fruit, serve it on top of the ricotta. You can make a little bruschetta uh, to make a vehicle for it. And again, just sort of highlighting the, the freshness of the cheese, it sort of punctuates whatever you serve it with um, and just makes for a nice lighter refreshing meal rather than like a pizza where you're getting, you have it, it's really hot and it can feel a little heavy and rich when it's extremely hot out. So you can kind of get those same flavors, but just in a way that feels a little more refreshing and a little lighter uh, for the season. So next, our next category within the umbrella of um, fresh cheeses in this first category still is what I would call uh, with chev, so fresh goat cheese, and brebis, which is really the same thing as chev, but for, made out of sheep's milk. And these also will act very similar to uh, ricotta in terms of their texture. Uh, they're a little loose, they usually need a vehicle. Um, so another good option for a crostini or um, an open face sandwich. And the major difference here is they're one step up flavor wise from the ricotta, they're gonna be uh, a little more tangy and a little more bright. Uh, goat's milk has that kind of characteristic goat's milk tang uh, and can be a, a slightly acidic. So the good thing about these cheeses is that they stand up to a little more flavor. So if you're looking to do maybe some grilled vegetables or something that has a little bit more robust flavor, uh, then, and you don't wanna overpower the cheese, the, the chev or the brebi will be a little step up flavor wise. How do you spell brebi? Uh, it's B R E B I S, Brebi. B I S? Yeah. Thank you. Brebi. Ah, B I S. It's my approach at French, which is not the oh, best. <laughs> mine's, mine's not a winning one either. So, <laughs> but yeah, so the, the Brebi. Um, sometimes people have a proprietary name for it, or it might just be labeled in the States it's often labeled as fresh sheep cheese. So any of these are sort of synonymous terms. Um, but yeah, and that's a little more rich in body than the goat's milk cheese, uh, usually a little milder in flavor. I find it tends to be a little more lemony and bright, whereas the goat can have that slightly more like uh, aggressive tang to it. So it's gonna work different 
they both are going to work different with slightly different flavors based on your own preferences. But definitely, uh, these are great options for uh, some of these cool dishes. Um, I also love uh, to serve uh, a marinated or a grilled like a summer squash, like yellow squash, zucchini, anything, little patty pan, whatever is in season. I love to uh, serve that with a brebi, maybe a little lemon juice and some garlic and some fresh herbs. It's just like really refreshing and light. Um, and then once we get out of this category of fresh cheese, they're all under the umbrella of fresh cheese, but then probably the most common category or well-known category of fresh cheeses is what we call pasta filata. And that's a term that not, not a lot of people are familiar with, but you're definitely familiar with the cheeses that are pasta filata cheeses, because this is mozzarella, burrata, uh, provolone, cazio cavallo, all of these cheeses that uh, actually, uh, string cheese, like Oaxacan string cheese, all of these cheeses are made a, are made using a technique called pasta filata, which means us. Uh, it translates to stretch curd or spun paste. And this refers to the technique that actually is what differentiates these from the rest of the fresh milk cheeses. And this is the process of stretching or pulling the curd after it's been formed. So a lot of times you'll see, like if you've ever been to Italy, they have homemade mozzarella. And uh, lots of restaurants say that too. A lot of times what they actually do is it's really home pooled mozzarella, not homemade because they buy the curd and then they heat it up and pull it themselves, which is how you finish the cheese. So they sort of make it, they sort of don't. It depends on, on who it is, but this step is, is instrumental. It's not mozzarella or provolone before this, it's just a curd. And what happens is you get some really warm water very hot. Uh, in Italy, the people who make this cheese all the time have very weathered hands and can do it uh, with their bare hands, but it is quite hot and can be uncomfortable. At this point, most of these cheeses are pulled by machines uh, because you usually have to heat the water to at least 120 degrees in order to stretch it. So getting your fingers in there can be a little tricky and you have to keep dipping it in to pull it. So if you've ever seen a video of this, it's, it's the end process. It's when they might see them forming a ball or a braid sometimes, because once you pull that curd, it's very elastic. And if you've ever noticed when you eat mozzarella, uh, that there's sort of a string-like quality to the, the structure. Uh, well, this is 100% because of this process. It's actually um, really instrumental in the cheeses, especially in terms of how they operate as ingredients. Pasta filata cheeses, what happens is it from that stretching of the curd, you realign the casein, the protein structure into strings, which, and it sort of encapsulates the fat and the other things in between those layers. And this re restructuring of the, the cheese actually is what makes it melt really well and even and give you that pulley, you know, when you want something where you want that pool of cheese, like your favorite pizza, where you get that really long sort of unctuous effect, pasta filata cheeses are the best at, at accomplishing that because of the, this unique structure of theirs. Or string cheese, when you think of that, there's a little string-like particles. Well, that again is because of this process. Now, flavor-wise, these cheeses tend to be pretty mild. Uh, sometimes some are saltier than others. That's usually the main difference. But as we all know, they're very famous for being quintessential summer cheeses. If you think of just a really simple, um, you know, sort of heirloom tomato, fresh mozzarella salad uh, with some fresh herbs, a little olive oil, a little vinegar. Like we always think of tomatoes and mozzarella as being uh, synonymous with each other and going hand in hand. And um, a lot of this I think comes from Italian, the, pro the proliferation of Italian food and in the South where they make the mozzarella, that's also where all the beautiful San Marzano tomatoes and other tomatoes grow. So there's definitely a symbiosis there, um, but you can also get creative um, 
I think, again, it's really, I love to add more flavor to a dish. So I've actually made a caprese where I add peaches in addition to the, in addition to the tomato, still using mozzarella, or if you prefer um, the burrata. Burrata is essentially uh, mozzarella that's just been infused with Florida latte, which is just a, a cream or a curd. So kind of a loose, it's just very, um, people tend to go nuts for it. It's, it's a very simple cheese, but again, here's that same idea. You get some protein, you get the richness of the cheese, but it's a cheese that you serve, you know, room temp. So it's still refreshing, even though, you know, it, it's still made up of the same good stuff that all cheese is. It just somehow feels a little more summery and it has so many different, uh, there's so many different preparations that you can, or things that you can serve it with. Uh, prosciutto is very classically served with all of these things. If you want to keep it cold and refreshing, um, you can also, again, I think if you are a grill person, you know, if you're grilling some vegetables or fruit, that also is going to accompany it well. I think fresh herbs go with everything, especially when it's mild. So I always like to throw whatever. A lot of times people always think of tomatoes and basil but and, and mozzarella, but I actually prefer other or a mix of soft herbs. Um, basil's great, but like, I think mint goes excellent with both the cheese and, um, and, and the tomatoes. I also like to use, uh, fresh parsley or cilantro. If you like that, sometimes you can do a mix of them. It's fun to experiment and sort of bring out the different flavors. Um, but I always find that I, if I'm, if you're going to add fruit into the dish, I always love mint with fruit. I think it just brings is a nice compliment and something else you can do if you're getting a little tired of basil or maybe you don't have basil mint holds up a little better in the fridge so it's easier to keep around someone else suggested chives too yeah oh yeah chives for sure uh like wild you know spring onions chives garlic scapes any of those sorts of things if especially if you're more savory leaning and you don't uh want to incorporate the fruit it's always great to get some of those a um, little bit stronger flavor from the chives in there. So the next category um, that is still in this umbrella of fresh cheese is um, a cheese that maybe, I think halloumi more people are familiar with. There's also um, what we call bread cheese that originates from Finland. It's also known as Hustalipa or uh, there's a local proprietor that makes their own version called Brunusto or, uh, but bread cheese is what it is commonly translated as. And this is a cheese that uh, is actually browned on the outside, which is why they call it bread cheese. So after they form the cheese, they toast it or bake it. So it gets brown and bubbly on the outside. But due to the unique make of this cheese, much like halloumi, it's something that you can heat up and it gets kind of a little oozy, but it still holds its shape, kind of like panela, panella, um, the, the Spanish cheese. So this is a great cheese for summer because I always think of grilling in the summer. So you can grill this cheese right on the grill and then cut it up. And it's mostly just gives you kind of a, a squeaky, like a cheese curd. So a cheese curd is another thing you could use in the same sort of category in terms of its texture. But um, I just find it really refreshing uh, because you get that little bit of squeak, a little bit of meltiness without it being super ooey gooey and like, again, really rich and hot and heavy. Um, and I actually love to use this cheese in place of dishes where you might traditionally use feta, but you can also use feta if you like it. It's a little less salty than feta because it's not brined. And then you get that additional sort of toasty note from the, the grilling and on the outside of it. And one of my all time favorite dishes uh, for cheese in general is this style of cheese with uh, fresh watermelon. And then you drizzle some olive oil on there, maybe a little balsamic vinegar or saba. And then again, just some fresh herbs, uh, water, uh, basil's great, mint's great, combo of the two. And 
I just find this an incredibly refreshing dish. And it's, it's rich enough from the cheese that you'll feel satisfied. You can make a whole meal out of it, but it's not super heavy. And then with all the, um, you know, all the freshness and brightness from the watermelon, uh, it's, it's just really nice dish that, that satisfies without like being too much on a day like today. Yeah, actually, these are very similar to Bulgarian cheeses, so so that makes sense. Um, there, some of those cheeses you can actually grill as well. It depends on which one, but there are a couple of them that that you can also uh, have that similar property of of being able to be heated, but without like totally melting. Um, and another thing I know people like to do with this cheese. If you're someone who is looking to eliminate some carbs from your diet, uh, this cheese is great as a crouton on a salad. Like if you grill it up, get it nice and warm, and then cut it up into little cubes, throw it on a really nice, uh, fresh summer salad. And uh, again, it'll kind of give you that nice richness, fill you up but um, won't overpower the delicate like greens that you choose to put in the salad. And there's another one, if you wanted to do uh, the first dish, but kind of re-envision it as a salad, you could do some arugula with some watermelon and then cut this up, you know, kind of dressed the same way with the olive oil and the vinegar, just a super refreshing summer dish. Um, and uh, people in general, some people like to use the bread cheese in place of bread for that same reason, because they, if they're doing keto or they don't want the carbs, it's a little rich, but I mean, if, if you're, you're down for it, go for it, <laughs> because that's a lot of cheese, but, um, but you know, it's really uh, a really versatile product that you can use multiple different ways. And um, the traditional one from Finland was made using reindeer milk. Uh, but the ones that they make and that you can get here in the States are made with cow's milk. So a little less exotic, a little more palatable. And then, um, but any of those sort of grilling cheeses, uh, like I said, if you can't find the bread cheese, you can use halloumi or um, you can use panea, which you can get at a lot of uh, Mexican grocers here in the city. Uh, all of them will have that similar property that you need to put this dish together. And flavor wise, they're also quite similar. Or if you happen to be passing through Wisconsin and you get some fresh cheese curds that are still squeaky day off, you could also use these in a very similar way. I don't think you'd need to heat them, but their flavor and texture is very similar. So uh, it's another way like fried cheese curds are what we always think of with cheese curds, but in the summer, maybe that's a little much. So you could use cheese curds on a salad with some watermelon or uh, with peaches and kind of, again, still get your cheese fix, but without making it too heavy or intense. And then the last category in this fresh cheese world, which is more complicated than a lot of people think, is what I would call brined cheeses. So these are cheeses, uh, feta is definitely the, the most recognized in this category, but these are cheeses that after they're made, spend their life in brine, uh, which is a salt and water solution. So if you ever think of feta as being salty, that's because it absolutely is, <laughs> because it sits in salt all day. Uh, but this is, uh, it's, it's important to note that, because um, a lot of, I get confusion sometimes between feta and say a fresh mozzarella because fresh mozzarella sometimes comes packed in a liquid. But the difference is, is fresh mozzarella, that is not uh, brine. That is just sort of the leftover make liquid, which has a little bit of whey in it. So it's not soaking up more salt as it sits in it. That's really just because of its higher moisture content. If it sits in the, the water, it it, it lasts longer. It won't mold as quickly. It won't uh, go bad as quickly. So it's a similar process because the brine also preserves the feta, but um, the, the lack of salt is really going to change the overall uh, effect and the flavor in the end. So feta, because it is brined, it does have a slightly more intense flavor. 
uh, but can still be quite refreshing. So feta is great if you find that all of the other things in the components in your dish might be overpowering some of the milder cheeses we just talked about. That is a nice one to sort of still get that freshness, that lactic flavor uh, because of the salt, you get just a little bit more intensity so it can stand up to, uh, you know, slightly more um, intense flavors. So um, again, you know, to, I really like tomatoes with feta, uh, but I also salt my tomatoes uh, in general. So if you were like me and you like to salt your tomatoes, it's great to use feta because then you can skip that step because you get enough salt from that dish um, uh, to further the, the salt intake. Uh, one of my favorite heirloom tomato salads is you chop up a bunch of heirloom tomato salads or tomato heirloom tomatoes, and then you dress them with olive oil uh, and uh, a little bit of sherry vinegar or a light sort of uh, wine barrel aged vinegar if you have it, or you can even use apple cider, whatever is your go-to. I wouldn't do balsamic. I think it can overpower it. But then you just toss all the tomatoes up in that and add capers and feta. And then you top with some uh, chopped fresh mint and basil. And it's really, really delicious, really satisfying. And it feels hearty, even though it's still on the lighter side. Um, and definitely has a ton of flavor. So that's something that I'll make for dinner on probably on a night like tonight where I don't want to turn anything on in my kitchen and I don't want to eat anything remotely warm, <laughs> certainly not hot. And uh, that's just something really easy as a go-to that you can prepare and utilize some of these fresh cheeses uh, and just kind of pair them up with what's in season and what what's growing out there. So yeah, you guys have I, questions? I, I like to salt my watermelon. So, I mean, feta and watermelon together, that's always a go-to for me because then I can skip that step. And then yeah. I like doing it with um, some some onions as well. Get in like Ooh. some really nice, like, because it's all bold flavors. You get that sweetness, you get that saltiness, and then you get that sharpness in, from the onion and everything. It really works well together. So I'm going to have to try that. I've had watermelon and feta before, which I love too, because I also love salty watermelon, but mm -hmm. I've never tried it with the onions. I'll yeah. Have to... Yeah. It's good. So. It sounds good. <laughs> yeah. Okay, what about creamy cheeses like Laughing Cow, Philadelphia? So your cream cheese and your like um, the Laughing Cow, like the processed cheeses and such. Yeah, um, I mean, for sure, I think you can totally utilize them. If I'm being honest, I typically tend to think of them more as ingredients than uh, as cheeses you eat on their own, but that's maybe just my own, pre or obviously a bagel, I always think of with cream cheese, but um, you know, they're definitely lighter. Um, yeah, the Laughing Cow is is processed, uh, which is why it's so creamy. Um, so technically not a cheese, but a cheese food, but it's, it, if you like it, it doesn't matter. It just, you know, technically speaking, the process of making it is one step removed from the cheese. It's made from cheese, but cheese isn't the only ingredient uh, or the, the four essential ingredients of cheese, which is rennet, enzymes, milk uh and salt those are like usually the unless there's flavors added those are like what makes up cheese and then anything that sort of starts to incorporate more or is made from the cheese is then considered a, a process a cheese food or a, a processed cheese versus it can't legally be labeled as cheese um but i think Similar to the, that first category of fresh cheeses we talked about is where these would fall in because they don't have a lot, uh, they're not very aggressive flavor-wise. And they also, in the case of both of these are really soft and they need a vehicle. So I think these are gonna be cheeses that are gonna be good options for again, sort of like open face sandwich or a bruschetta or something that, you know, where you can use the cheese as the base because, you can't really eat cream cheese on its own or serve it on its own. It either has to go into the dish or, you know, it needs something to, to be spread on. But I would say 
both of those you could use in a very similar way to the first ones we discussed, such as the ricotta or the chev or the brebi. Okay, any other questions on these cheeses? Okay, definitely I've added some things to my shopping list. <laughs> So very like bread cheeses. I don't think that's something we've really explored in this household. So I think we need to. Ooh, I so. think I think you'll have a hit. Kids tend to love it. Yeah, yeah. It sounds like it's up everyone's alley here. So and the nice thing about it is to heat it up. You can um, if you're grilling. If you already have the grill fired up, great. If not, you can just heat it up in the skill in a skillet you know, get it. So it mm -hmm. starts to get a little brown again and a little bit gooey and then take it off and you can cut it up into whatever size. That sounds great. Yeah. Sounds delicious. Well, thank you, Lydia. As always, this was amazing. Asaf, do you have one more yeah. question? I have one more question. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's go. Uh, what would you say will feel lighter, uh, cow, sheep, or goat cheese? I don't know if any of them are lighter. Um, it, it, because it, it's really more, I think about just your preference of flavors. Mm. I think the cow's milk is the mildest in that really fresh category. Like ricotta to me is more mild than a chev or a fresh sheep cheese. But, uh, so in terms of flavor impact, I would say cow's milk is the most mild, but there's also like this strange thing like sheep's milk actually has the highest percentage of fat and solids in it. So when you make a fresh cheese out of it, it actually, a lot of times people think more fat makes it heavy, but it actually gives it a kind of more like whipped consistency. So even though it's richer because it's higher in fat and these solids, I think it reads on the palate as lighter and that's because, again, of that constitution, it just has sort of more of a like whipped or like aerated sort of texture than the other two. So it's sort of like a, a strange answer because in terms of its nutrition, it's the richest. But in terms of the eating experience, I think it can actually be the, the most delicate. So I, I thought about this summer and I thought the goat cheese that I tried felt a bit heavier to me. So I maybe I wouldn't go with that in the summer, but okay. I think, well, I think too, the thing with goat cheese is if you like it, you can eat it with anything really. But I think because of that more assertive tang of it, it tends to pair well with a lot of things uh, that are more intense. Like I love goat cheese and beets, but that's not very summery at all. So a lot more, it, it stands up to more intense flavors and like root vegetables. So I could see where you sort of like naturally just associate it with, with cooler weather dishes just because of that more intense flavor profile. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you for your questions, Asaf. And yeah. this has been awesome. I'm sure everyone is definitely planning some cheese purchases in the near future. Have a cold <laughs> cheese dinner tonight. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> So everyone have a fantastic evening. We will have Mary Ross with us tomorrow uh, for uh, a discussion on how best to enjoy your wine. Should you decant? What temperature should you have from things at? How should you store it? All of those important questions that you want to know, as you all have been learning so much about wine, let's make sure we're consuming it properly. So thank you. Thank you yeah. again, Lydia and everyone. Have a great evening and please stay cool and stay hydrated. Yes. So, <laughs> bye. bye.